My name is Selena Hernandez, and this is A.V. Yeager, and we are both a part of the leadership team at the East Harlem COAD, which stands for Community Organizations Active in Disasters. For accessibility reasons, I just wanted to describe the photos real quick. There's three images on screen. On the left is a screenshot of our mental health video playlist. In the center is an image of COAD members looking at a community map. And on the right is a photo of one of our recent events of community members doing a painting activity. When disaster strikes, is your go bag ready? So this is part of our preparedness video series, which is available on the homepage of our website. Our goal with these videos was to really just help our neighbors understand how quickly and unexpectedly something can happen. And that having even a basic plan and a small bag with essential items can help you be ready and feel more prepared. So there's a few different disaster scenario videos here, and also a two minute instructional video on how to create a go bag yourself. So on the right are two Instagram posts, one captioned in English and one in Spanish, asking what's in your bag and showing items that you can keep with you that could be useful in case you got stuck at work or on the train. And some of those items are headphones, extra keys, chapstick, water, a snack, medicine, band-aids, cash, an umbrella, a list of your medications, and more. So I just want to share a quick background of the COAD. We came together in 2015, but it grew out of a few years of conversations before that. After seeing the devastation of Hurricane Katrina and the failure of government at every level, it became really clear that a community-driven emergency response was needed for East Harlem. In 2014, you might remember there was a gas leak and building explosion on 116th and Park, and several East Harlem organizations did response and recovery work after that event, but we were not really well coordinated and sometimes organizations overlapped in an unhelpful way where there was like too much of one item or service and not enough of something else. So a year after that, we officially formed the COAD so that we could better coordinate during a disaster and ask our member organizations who can do what. So maybe this organization has meeting space. This organization has vans and drivers that could pick up or deliver items. This organization has a group of volunteers that are ready to go. So we can help each other quickly find out also like what's going on in different parts of the neighborhood. Where is it flooding? Where is it not? So our members are mostly organizations, churches, small businesses businesses, but we also have community residents who are just interested in emergency preparedness. So anyone can join our meetings, which are monthly on the third Thursday of the month from 4 to 5 p.m. And we alternate between in-person and virtual meetings for accessibility. And we now work directly with the Department of Health and the Department of Emergency Management so we can quickly communicate what's actually going on in East Harlem, what our neighbors and member organizations are seeing, and get resources where they need to go faster. So some of our previous projects that we have worked on have been a series of mental health videos. After taking surveys of our membership, we asked, particularly during the pandemic, what is it you would like to see or learn more about? And a lot of people said they'd like to learn about housing and food insecurity and have more information around that. But another big one was mental health and information around that. And so we created this series of mental health videos that were at first open and available just if you were a member. And now we have opened them. It's very useful information. You can do one video at a time or you can take the whole series. It's a great activity to do with staff, colleagues, but also participants of a program. We had a dual language emergency food hotline. During COVID-19, we had to pivot just like everybody else. And a lot of our information was about preparedness and about being ready and go bags. But then it shifted to spreading the information to the extent that we could, right? Because we were all learning things as we were going. And so we created this food hotline during the COVID response. We also did PPE distributions, distributed 
masks, sanitizers. And then outside of the pandemic specifically, we also expanded what it means to be prepared. And so thus the mental health preparedness so that it's a more of a holistic approach, but also CPR training, stop the bleed training, trauma-informed communication, inviting the CPR unit of the FDMY to come and show people how to do compressions, how to do CPR, because those are things that can help you. We want to, people to be prepared, not only at the hyper-local level, but within your own community, within your own household. You don't want to use these things, but knowing how to stop a bleed before EMS comes or learning how to do the compressions can help save a loved one's life. And so we provide that information. This is September, so it's Emergency Preparedness Month. And so you probably will be seeing or have seen a lot of information and events that have gone on this month. We continue after September, but one of the big events that we have annually is our Emergency Preparedness Fair. And so we had it just this past Saturday at the Dream School. And that's an event where we educate people about go bags, what they are, who needs them, what goes into them. And we have a wealth of resources that are available in the community. And so we had that and it was an awesome event. We're always trying to improve accessibility in all of our events. We're continually educating ourselves so that we can continue to do that because inclusivity is a very important part of what we do. We have very specific trainings for young folks and then for seniors and older folks and also for caregivers and we are able to provide preparedness training in those specific groups as well. This is a picture of one of our colleagues and myself at a pre-K teaching about preparedness in case of a blackout or a power outage. Those kids were amazing and were able to get the information the same way we were and they were very receptive. We believe in preparedness for all ages and then during different seasons if they there's extreme heat happening, we do distribution. So we've created cooling kits. We've given cooling kits, which are mini coolers, just to be mindful about power outages and heat. It'll have stuff like cooling bandana to put around your neck. If it's really hot, it'll have the cooler kit and, some, and with an ice pack in it in case you lose power and you need to keep medicine cool. You can put it in that container. Stuff like electrolyte mix, vitamin C. And so we do that. We do the go back preparedness we gave during the pandemic wellness kits because there was such a shortage of, of everything that we wanted to provide things like tea because people had sore throats and, and lozenges and electrolytes for water. So we had a whole bunch of things that we put in that kit to give during that pandemic. This is a model of the disaster cycle, which has four phases, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. So the co-ed works in all four of these phases, but today we're mostly going to be talking about preparedness. But just to give you a quick example, example of each of the four phases, we could use a home fire as an example, because that's the most common risk or hazard. So mitigation is about reducing the risk of a disaster happening at all. And the example of a fire that might look like locking up your lighters and matches or practicing safety around like electrical appliances, power strips, outlet. Preparation for a home fire could look like installing a smoke detector or practicing escaping your home safely and establishing a place to meet up with some other people in your household once everyone's out. Response to a home fire would look like actually escaping safely and implementing your plan. And then an example of a recovery would be finding a place to stay immediately after the fire and then setting up a new home. So we're going to talk briefly about five things you can do to be prepared and feel prepared for an upcoming dot, 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 right? Because <laughs> we don't always know what's coming. But one of the simplest things you can do, communication is a big part of what we do. So passing on the information to our membership organizations, the information we get from emergency management, from the Department of Health, and so a great thing to do is sign up for Notify NYC Alerts. And that's simply an app that you can put on your phone. You can sign up for emails as well, depending on how you want to receive the information. And you can tailor it to yourself to customize your alerts according to what you want, where you live. There are multiple languages available on Notify NYC. So it's very accessible in that way. You can get notifications in your own language. If you can download the app, that would be very good. They give you information about weather, severe weather changes to mass transit, information on things going on in the area, how to stay safe. I just want to add, they're really customizable. So sometimes I don't want to sign up for these things because it's just like constant alerts I don't need. And I'm just like jumpy with my phone for no reason. So you can check only the things that you think apply to you and then you can change that at any time. So the next thing you can do is to install a smoke detector. So when a smoke alarm sounds, you can 
have as little as two minutes to safely escape your home, which is really not a lot of time, especially if it's maybe waking you up in the middle of the night. So it's really important to know your different options to get out and practice them, especially if you have mobility challenges or if you're caring for children, the elderly or disabled folks. The Red Cross has a free program that will not just give you a smoke alarm, but will actually come to your home and install it for you. You want to have one, if possible, in every bedroom or sleeping area and common area. And in your kitchen, you don't want it too close to the stove, which seems a little counterintuitive, but if it's too close, it's just going to be going off all the time and you're just going to take it out. So you want it like at the very edge of your kitchen or just outside your kitchen. And also, if possible, you want to sleep with the door closed because that contains whatever room the fire and the smoke is in, it contains it. So that keeps the smoke, which can be very deadly outside of the rest of the home and give you more time to escape safely. Our resource page has links not just to sign up for free alarms, but also for other guides to fire safety in your home and also a ton of activity pages and coloring pages for kids that will help you have that conversation in a way that's accessible and not too overwhelming, but helps them know what they need to know if something happened when you weren't there or if they had to navigate that on their own in some way. Number three would be assembling a go bag. So a go bag for those that are not familiar is a bag that you have prepared with the things that you need, such as a first aid kit, toiletries, glasses, medication, copies of important paperwork, but also clothes for two to three days in case you need to grab it and go. Sometimes it can be a stay at home bag and you need it to shelter in place. And so go bags are good to have anywhere you spend a lot of time. So if you are at home, you should have a go bag for each person who lives with you. And that includes animals. And they should be somewhere near the front exit. So if there's a closet nearby the way out of the door, then that would be the ideal place to put it. Because the idea is if they're in an emergency, you have to grab it and go. It's accessible. You don't want to be looking under the bed in the plastic thing that you put the winter clothes away for the season. You want it to be accessible. And the go bag, you should check on at least once a year, but sometimes twice because seasons change. For the summer, you may want the lighter clothes. You may want a light jacket, a light poncho, but in the winter, you may want that heavy hoodie, one of those small pouchy jackets and that you can put in a pouch. A lot of people can be intimidated about putting one together because they can be costly, but you can use items that you have in your house. Items that maybe you don't wear too much, but you don't want to throw away. Hey, maybe I'll put that in the go bag. Oh, I have these spare glasses that I don't wear too much, but I still useful put that in the go bag because copies of things like prescriptions, a rent receipt or proof of where you live, your ID, medications you take are all important things to have. If you have some spare cash, it's important to put that in the go bag as well. These important documents you make a copy of and you put them in the plastic bag. That way, if it's raining or wet out, they don't get wet and ruined. That is what a go bag is. I should also add that some snacks to go in there, some healthy non-perishable snacks and water. And it should be in a bag that you can carry on your own. It should be in the bag for all the other people who live with you in the house that they can carry on their own. For some people that may be taking a bag on wheels. For others, it's a small bag. It depends on how you pack. The co started making these bags very close to when we started. And at the beginning, we invited the state to do the go bags because you can invite them and they'll come and do an amazing presentation and they'll give you this big bag. But after that first year, decided to make our own sort of starter kit go bag because no bag that they give you, that anyone gives you is ever going to be completed because you need to put your own clothes and your own documents in, right? And so we felt that we wanted something tailored to our community with items that you can buy in the community that are affordable. So we go as far as to have a list of local stores where you can get the items to put in. But just as it has right here in the list, you can use items you already have. We don't want it to be something that's cost prohibitive. So we also want to prepare not just to evacuate, but to shelter in place, which means you just want to be able to stay safe wherever you happen to be when something happens. So mostly we think about preparing at home, but like Selena said, you also want to have a few things with you in your bag just kind of all the time in case you get stuck somewhere. So a few things you want to think about for sheltering in place are ways to stay warm or cool depending on the season. If you lose power and we're experiencing extreme weather, you want to, if possible, try to refill your medications before they run out entirely so you could be okay.
okay staying in for a few days. You want to, if possible, try to keep some extra food and emergency bottled water. Even if you don't drink bottled water all the time, you want to keep a few bottles on hand for a disaster. You also want to think about keeping yourself and your loved ones as relaxed and entertained or distracted as possible during a high stress situation. For myself, I keep my favorite book and a sketch pad with pencils. My mom has Alzheimer's and she loves gardening. So I keep like a flower themed coloring book and some coloring pencils that she's never seen before. So it would be like new and engaging for her. If I need it, it's there. I also keep a few pieces of everyone's favorite candy in a Ziploc bag just for a small comfort. And I did that because I bought Halloween candy recently and I just skimmed a few off the top and threw them in the go bag. So that's another reason to keep it out all the time. So it's really easy, like Selena said, to just throw things in there and you don't have to go dig it out. And like the more you engage with it and update it, the more it keeps like preparedness on your mind and the more helpful that bag is going to be for you and your family. You don't need to buy new things for it. Just when you get something new, put the old one in the bag. And on the right here is a guide to prescription preparedness from the New York City Department of Health. It's available in multiple languages that will also be linked on our resources, but it's about keeping medication on hand. If you evacuate, take your medications with you in the original bags if possible. And most importantly, have a list of the medications you take that your pharmacy or doctor's office can print for you. Sometimes helps to have that extra layer of like legitimacy that this isn't just what I wrote down, but this is from my doctor. This is from my pharmacy showing like I take this currently. Number five, make a plan for your household and loved ones like they do in school. You remember when you were a little one and school all of a sudden it's a fire drill. Maybe pick one day out of every six months. Pick a day where you can go over your plan. What am I going to do if there's a fire and I can't access the building? What if there's a fire and we have to escape the building? What are we going to do? What are we going to do if we get separated? Is there a place that we can meet? What are those meeting places? Where is it? Is there a, a park on the corner or across the street somewhere safe that everybody can get to that maybe has a bathroom? Is it maybe the library? Wherever that is for you, do you have a, a neighbor, a trusted neighbor a block or two away? Where is that place? If all of a sudden we don't have access to our telephones here or something happens where you can't reach someone locally, but maybe you have access to someone who is out of state or in another borough? Do we call them? Is that the person we call and leave a message with and everyone calls that person or emails that person or text because sometimes text will work when the phone doesn't go through? And then the go bag. Do we have a go bag? And sometimes it sounds overwhelming, but if you just do one thing at a time so that you're not overwhelmed. One of the main reasons people are not prepared or don't get prepared is because one, they don't want to think about it, but two, we have so many things. We live in New York City. There's so many things going on in our lives. Every Everyone has multiple things, wears many hats, works too hard. There's a lot, cares for other people. It sometimes feels like just another thing. But when they have these fairs, when they have these book bag distributions, whatever it is, you take it. Oh, look, I got a flashlight today in this fair. I went, bam, I got the flashlight. Oh, I just got my new license. Let me make a copy. Bam, it's in there. I already paid this rent bill. Let me just put it in my bag in case I need a proof of where I live, if there's a fire or whatever. Doing these little things can help you really have peace of of mind. We're not saying it's going to be all great, but when you're prepared, sometimes things can be less scary when they do happen because you want to prepare during blue skies for when those gray skies come. You don't want to be thinking about things that you may already know, but will forget because you're like, oh gosh, I'm worried there's an emergency. So create that meeting place. Everyone memorize a phone number. Okay. Back in the day, everyone knew numbers. Now people rely on their cell phones. Memorize one or two numbers. Encourage your partner, your children, your kids, whomever to memorize at least two phone numbers so you have that and get that meeting place. That's number five, a way to make a plan for your household. Uh, one thing I'll add. So I'm a caregiver for both of my parents who are elderly and disabled. And I worry a lot about what happens if I'm in a car accident or something. So I keep a digital document where I update with their medications and everything about their care. And my cousin who lives in another state who would be the most likely substitute caregiver knows how to get to that document if necessary. So it has information about their appointments and just anything about their care. So I don't have to like constantly have those conversations. But I know that if something happened to me, there's like a handoff document to somebody, whether that's your sister, your neighbor, whoever, you could use that for your pets, for your kids, for anyone you're responsible for. I also just wanted to show you our link tree really quick that you can get to through our website, our social media. So our co-ed website is linked here. You can click to become a co-ed member. You could contact us to request info on any kind of preparedness topic. Here's the link for signing up for Notify NYC 
alerts and the free smoke alarms, quick links for who do I contact during a particular kind of disaster. These are a bunch of different documents that you could either use to prepare a go bag or put in the go bag itself. The packing list in multiple languages. Don't feel like you have to put every item on there in the bag. Just say, what of these do I have lying around? Put them in a bag right now and go from there. There's also a list of stores in East Harlem where you can find these items, like little worksheets for your emergency contacts or your medical information. I really encourage you to look through this and see what might be useful to you. We have public health information, preparedness for specific groups, hazard specific things, and mental health, community building, and more. What kind of special considerations should you have for preparedness for someone with a disability? Are there things that you should be thinking about above and beyond what we're talking about otherwise? I'm just thinking about people who are caretakers and that there are sometimes unique challenges for people who have mobility issues or something like that. Is there something else in addition to this you should be thinking about for those populations? First, I'll say I think as a disabled person myself and someone who's also a caregiver, we're already experts in preparedness. And we're both extremely vulnerable and extremely prepared already because we're living small disasters and unexpected challenges every day. Mm -hmm. So I would say like plan more in advance and plan more thoroughly would be the two tidbits I would share. I'm thinking about things like exit plans and stuff. If you are in a building where you have to think about that differently, or even if there's some advocacy you need to do on your own behalf within your building or place of work Mm -hmm. or something, just to think ahead of time about how you're able to exit safely if there's an emergency. So I'll say the best preparedness, whether you're disabled or not, is community because you're never going to have every single thing you need. So you're going to end up relying on your relationships and your people. And a disaster is a terrible time to try to build new relationships. Your first call is going to be someone you know and trust. Even if they're not the most knowledgeable, you're going to lean on what's worked for you before and who you know well. Build your community now, not after something happens, whether you're disabled or not. If you're trying to build a space that's to build like a safe space, the best way to be accessible is to have options. Don't just think about what works for you. Think about what if someone has the opposite need of mine or just anytime you can add options, you're adding access points. One more resource I'll point out just really quickly, hospital go bags and medical advocacy. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. something I do for my parents is I made a four by six index card with all of their medications, recent hospitalizations, name, birth date. And also like for my mom, for example, she has Alzheimer's. So I write like just a few tidbits about her. So Uh someone could know how to start a conversation with her or how to engage with her and help make her feel safe. I put a card for each of my parents on a lanyard. So if something happened and I needed to stay with one of them and the other one needed to go somewhere else, like to the hospital, all of their information would be with them and wearable so they don't have to remember to hold it so that medical advocacy can go with them in a way. Another thing is the hospital go bag. So I spend more time than anyone would like in, in emergency rooms or waiting rooms. So it's about staying comfortable because if you're having a long wait or if you can't get a room and you're being seen in the hallway, even small discomforts become really overwhelming really quick so just like helpful items to stay comfortable this is where being a good citizen could be important because it may not be you is your neighbor on a wheelchair is someone on your floor someone who requires breathing or something that plugs in in order to survive right and thrive these are things that it's important to be able to communicate if you have to evacuate if you have the fdmy coming my neighbor's on the second floor she's on a wheelchair even when you're calling just so you're informing Mm -hmm. so people know i know that con ed mentioned that there's a program it's a way of communicating who those people are. They have like a list of who the people are who need access to sort of the life-saving equipment that has to be plugged in. So they have a communication program around that. But it's important to know that not everybody knows each other, even if they live on the same floor, but being a caretaker for people or a good community member for even when it's extreme heat. I don't know if Doña Lola has AC. Let me check on her and see Mm -hmm. if she's okay. Has she drank water? Is she hot? So checking on each other is really important during those times it's part of why the co-ed exists because we're hyper local and trying to just be here for the community because you're the first responder Mm -hmm. not the first responder right it's you until they come that's important and then just on like logistical things making sure the go kit is 
something that's manageable for that person. Mm -hmm. Carol, she's on a scooter and she has like this bag that's like this size and she has it on the scooter and those have all her emergency preparedness items. It fits on the scooter, it fits. And so she's able to wheel out and go and have that. Mm -hmm. So thinking about that, don't get yourself a big 20 pound bag if you can't manage it. We're not in a current emergency situation so that we can think real clearly about what we need, what we can rationally pack in a bag and carry with us and think about all those things like appreciated that you talked about animals and we're thinking about food and clothes and that sort of thing so I just really appreciate all that practical advice it's like a really simple way to take care of your community or someone else if you have extra of something when you're packing your go bag like my kids went through a band-aid phase that they're now out of and I have five boxes of band-aids or where did all these flashlights come from throw an extra thing if it's not too heavy in your bag that you could offer to somebody else if you can share that's great 